All right, my name is Stellan Windhagen. Um, I'm leading the Resistance Studies Initiative, and welcome very much to uh, today. Uh, this is part of a uh, number of different things we are doing. Um, this is an extra event, uh, but we will also have on our normal schedule of Resistance Studies speakers, uh, John Higginson speaking on Monday, December 4, uh, 4 to 6. So if you're interested in that kind of information and other events that we are doing, we have a, a November 9 uh, workshop that is dealing with uh, civil disobedience, for example, and other things coming up. Then you could just sign your name here, uh, an email, uh, so that we will put you on our list circle. So I'll let this one circulate. All right. Um, we also over there have some uh, cookies and fruit, and we have uh, actually a unique journal, the Journal of Resistance Studies, which is um, produced from here. Um, it's um, coming out two times a year. It's focusing on, on uh, academic research on resistance. Um, and much of that you can also access uh, free uh, uh, online. And we also have some information about the Resistance Studies Initiative, what we are doing and so on here at UMass. So uh, welcome very much and feel free to take uh, stuff there, <coughs> cookies, whatever. And I'm very happy to have Eric Stoner here. Eric uh, has been um, a good friend and contact for uh, some years, but uh, it took some time for me to uh, get organized enough to invite him here. So Eric is uh, one of the founders of Waging Nonviolence. In my view, uh, the best and perhaps uh, only uh, outlet with that kind of professional approach to journalists uh, describing nonviolent activism around in the world. Because there has been a lot of attempts over the years, like independent media centers, maybe you've heard about, that were uh, arising in connection to uh, the global justice movement where amateurs were trying to describe what kind of activism people were doing. And that was good in, it, in its way, but, uh, of course, because a lot of reports were coming up, but they didn't have that kind of professional approach to the, the handicraft of actually doing reporting. And that is the ambition, I would say, of Witching on Violence. So we are happy to have you here, Eric. Thank you. And um, I'll let you talk. and. Um, the plan is about an hour, one hour, 15 minutes, and then we'll sure. have a discussion. Yeah. All right? All right. So, Eric, please. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. It's nice to uh, be here with you. Um, I have a somewhat unusual path to the world of journalism and to nonviolence social movements. Uh, I actually started off on the other end of the political spectrum. Uh, my first job was uh, working in, in Washington, D.C., in the world of private intelligence, uh, helping protect U.S. corporate power abroad. So I was kind of on the other team, on the other side of things. And uh, it just so happened that while I was there, I took a course um, uh, by a, uh, a great teacher and longtime journalist named Coleman McCarthy. Um, and uh, he's kind of a legend in the peace education world. And he exposed me to uh, stories of nonviolent resistance and peacemakers uh, that really kind of shattered my worldview um, at the time and uh, showed me that there was another way to effectively um, resist uh, injustice. And um, yeah, and, and just another way to live and be in the world, really, that I didn't think was possible. Um, so it was a kind of a conversion experience that put my life on a very different track. Um, and it also, you know, showed me, I think, the power of good storytelling and, and journalism and kind of sparked my interest in, in that in the first place. Um, I then ended up getting involved in the anti-war movement kind of prior to the U.S. invasion of Iraq and started writing during that period. Um, I, I was first writing for my local kind of newspaper back home, um, and then wrote for uh, a progressive policy think tank in Washington, and later for magazines and newspapers and that kind of thing. And, um, and then about eight years ago, uh, 
um, I got together with a couple close friends who are also journalists um, to start a new publication called Waging Nonviolence that was really going to be focused on covering um, social movements and kind of the daily twists and turns of, of nonviolent um, nonviolent resistance, right? And to show how people are experimenting with this stuff every day. Um, and, uh, but before I get into our approach to that, I want to kind of take a step back and look at um, why it's so difficult to get decent reporting uh, from the mainstream media um, on this topic, and then also offer a few thoughts on how movements can, can try to overcome those hurdles. Um, so, Let's see. So yeah, um, I think I'm not really going to be shocking anybody by saying that uh, you know we the media is in a, in a state of crisis right now, um, or maybe it's facing multiple crises at once. That might be a better way to put it. You know, from kind of a failing business model, right, where you see lots of newspapers going under in the last few years, to um, to the fact that like uh, Americans trust in the media as an institution. Right, is at a historic kind of all-time low. Um, and uh, that's not because I think uh, it's fake news, you know, as uh, Trump likes to call it, but really because the media fails to, kind of repeatedly fails to hold power to account. Um, and why is this? I, I think uh, <clears throat> the corporate nature, right, of, of our mainstream media, I think, is at the core of the problem. You know, while they still strive to kind of project an image of being objective, that's still kind of the goal in the, in the mainstream world, um, the fact is that the dominant media companies, right, are huge companies, right, that have their own interests, which often align with those at the top, both in the corporate and the government world. Uh, you can see how this plays out in a number of ways. Um, one of which is their kind of proclivity to, uh, to bury stories that would really do real damage to, to those in power. I think you could see this in, for example, the recent revelations right around like Harvey Weinstein, right? And how long it took for that to come out, right? That some media had that story for years and that was kind of an open secret, but it took so long for that to kindly break. Um, there's also many stories of, of uh, media holding or delaying uh, publication of stories um, at the government's request, right? Uh, because uh, they feel like it would do damage. So for example, you know, CBS media, maybe you remember, um, held news and photos of uh, the U.S. soldiers uh, torturing Iraqis at Abu Ghraib, right, at the Bush administration's request. Um, and they only published once another smaller media got access and was going to, to beat them to the story. Um, so I think it's important to, to kind of point out that uh, what comes along with this is kind of a, a, a top-down approach to understanding of power and, and how change happens, right? Contrary to how those of us that care about social movements see things as often coming from the bottom up. Um, and uh, you can kind of see this in, in uh, again, a number of ways, one of which is kind of just the range of debate in the media, right? And what views are allowed into the mainstream conversation. And that it often reflects the divide between uh, Republicans and Democrats or just kind of those at the top, right? And when, when they are in agreement, there's often no debate in the media. Um, one place where you can see this most clearly um, is on the question of military spending, right? That, that both parties consistently agree that we need to spend more on the military, and therefore we don't ever see any kind of debate, right, in the, in the media about it. Um, so, for example, this year, um, you know, we're spending, a conservative estimate is $700 billion, right, on, on the military, which breaks down to about $23,000 a second, right, over the course of the year, um, and yet uh, passed with no debate, right? And so we're never given a chance really to chime in and say if that's really how we want our taxes spent, you know? Um, and uh, 
And we're also not given any sense of what the trade-offs are, right? So, for example, uh, in September, the Senate overwhelmingly approved an $80 billion increase, right, for the military, which was far more than Trump asked for and uh, was more than it actually would cost to make all public universities and colleges tuition free in the US, right? That was just the increase in military spending that was just approved and there was no, no discussion of it, right? So that's one way where you see kind of the media's approach um, to, to power, right? Another is in the way that they direct, where they direct their resources and reporters, right? That they have people that are dedicated to covering, you know, the White House press conference, the Pentagon, City Hall, you know, those kinds of things. But that they don't ever have dedicated uh, reporters focused on movements, you know, covering, for example, the movement for black lives or the leading immigration rights groups or environmental justice groups. Um, and or even more traditional organizing like unions. You know, they don't have bureaus or, or beats that are really covering organized labor, for example, most, most media. And that is because I think they don't see their meetings or their decisions as really being how change happens, right? Or being impactful. Um, and so it, it reflects their kind of innate bias, right? On how, how change happens and a kind of a misunderstanding of that. And uh, it's not only disempowering, right, uh, but it reinforces that idea that it's the only or maybe the most effective way that we engage in our democracy is through voting, right, every two or four years. Um, and so it's because of this lack of appreciation of grassroots organizing and kind of a bias towards official sources that uh, mainstream media often ignore or misunderstand or misconstrue uh, movements, social movements, and how they work, right? To give uh, one clear example of this, uh, I just wanted to look at a, uh, a one uh, story of a victory for the struggle for undocumented people. Uh, let's see. So, back in 2014, uh, most sheriffs in the state of Oregon um, uh, decided to refuse to cooperate with ICE and to, uh, which meant that they would not be handing over kind of voluntarily or cooperating in, in kind of helping deport um, undocumented people. And at the time, uh, uh, the New York Times published uh, this story here, which, you know, gave credit to a judge's decision uh, and which followed a lawsuit from the ACLU. Uh, but there was kind of no mention of any kind of grassroots organizing that went into this victory, not even mentioned in the story anywhere. So this is depicted as kind of coming out of nowhere, right, at the time. And uh, a couple weeks prior to the time story, we published this story here, which showed uh, essentially that uh, in Oregon, people had been organizing literally for years, right, the immigrant community, and uh, they had been holding events, they had been meeting with all these sheriffs, they had even escalated into uh, campaigns of civil disobedience um, uh, before, uh, years before the ACLU filed their suit and years before the court ruled that what the police were doing was unconstitutional, right? So this is just two very different perspectives, right, on the same story. You know, one is top-down, where you don't show anything else happening, and the other is showing that this victory really would not have been possible, right, without serious organizing happening over the course of years, right, uh, from the bottom. Um, so just very, very different perspectives, and you see this all the time when you start to pay attention uh, to the mainstream media. <coughs> the next point, is that uh, there is kind of part of the top-down uh, understanding of power also involves this old journalism adage like if it bleeds it leads right um, that there is kind of an inherent bias towards violence right or that violence is seen as uh, the the way that change happens ultimately and uh, you know that uh, you know, 
it kind of, uh, it, you know, there's a bias towards violence and that especially kind of in terms of justifying and legitimizing state violence, right? Um, whether that's war or whether it's deploying kind of heavily armed, uh, you know, uh, police officers to places like Ferguson. <coughs> um, to see this clearly, uh, just think of the moment um, where, where Trump has received the most positive coverage during his time so far. Anybody have any thoughts of what that might be? When that might have been? North Korea. Well, you thought that the mother of all bombs. Mm. That's one. Um, but, but now he's become presidential. You know, when he, when he bombed Syria, for example, in April, mm -hmm. the media was gushing, right? even though they had been critical the day before, right? Basically, all the media got on board, the TV and kind of print media, and you just had this kind of overflow of support for Trump, which is so dangerous, right? Because it shows him that by doing this kind of thing, this is how he's going to kind of build his popularity. So as, as Glenn Greenwald at The Intercept uh, has, has put it, kind of in wartime, TV news converts into a kind of state media, right? Um, on MSNBC, for example, you had Brian Williams gushing, right, about the, the beautiful pictures of Tomahawk missiles uh, leaving the ships, right, to, to bomb Syria. Or you had on CNN Fareed Zakaria saying that this was the moment that Trump became president, right? And you heard that kind of sentiment a lot right around that time. Um, so, since most media don't cultivate um, long-term relationships with movements or organizers, um, they, often don't, they often miss the many months or sometimes years that go into planning and preparing for movements, right? And the, the victories and failures kind of along the way um, that really happen before there is a major breakthrough um, and thousands of people are on the street. So they only cover movements when they're forced to often because they've grown to the size that you just cannot ignore them. Uh, and by jumping in kind of at this late stage in the trajectory of a movement, um, they inevitably depict them as more unplanned or um, you know, spontaneous right, than they actually are. Uh, and because to do anything else would mean to admit their bias right, and their kind of mistake. So at, at Waging Nonviolence, um, we've experienced this firsthand a number of times, but probably most clearly around the story of Occupy Wall Street. One of our editors, uh, Nathan Schneider, he went to some of the first planning meetings for Occupy that were happening in Tompkins Square Park in, in New York. And at the time, there were maybe 60 people sitting around a tree talking about what Occupy might look like. And at one point, Somebody said, we don't want any journalists in the circle. And a guy from the New York Times stood up and walked out. And uh, my friend Nathan, he stood up and said, well, I write for this publication that focuses on movements and activism and think it might be helpful to have somebody here to document this. And in what kind of be would become true Occupy fashion, they had a heated half an hour debate about whether he could stay. And uh, in the end, uh, you know, they raised their hands and wiggled their fingers and came to consensus that he could stay. Um, so he was really the only reporter to cover the movement before uh, it, it actually happened, right? When it was just an idea. And at that point, he approached a lot of other media to see if they would take a story about this, right? So he, he wrote to the New York Times and the Washington Post but also to progressive media like The Nation magazine. And nobody wanted a story, right? These are in the weeks kind of before Occupy happened. He even got an email back from the Washington Post editor saying that he'd lived in DC for, since 1998 and that he said, what do you say? He said offhand uh, that he could think of only a few protests that would be worth covering, right? So just kind of a very clear dismissal, right, of the power of a protest. Um, because of that, Nathan then ended up writing those first reported stories in Occupy for our site because no one else would take it. Um, and uh, they ended up getting real traction. And 
being shared around and republished a lot and helping to kind of drum up support really for the soon to be occupation. So here, let's see, here's just a couple of screenshots of a couple of the articles that we published in the weeks before Occupy actually started. Um, and we have, uh, we have uh, several others as well, but these are the first kind of in-depth stories about Occupy that were, were really written. Um, needless to say, you know, weeks later, this becomes a leading international story, and the media, like Time Magazine, called it spontaneous, right? With no sense of that there was months of planning for this again, right? So you can see how that works. Um, that being said, uh, movements still need to work really hard, I think, to try to get the attention and favorable coverage from the mainstream. That media work and communications are key, really key tasks for any social movement. One key concept from the field of civil resistance that I think helps explain this is called the Pillars of Support. I'm sure if you've heard of this, but it's, uh, here's a graphic that kind of shows what that looks like. Uh, but it's basically the idea that any regime, corporation, power, uh, ultimately depends on the cooperation, right, of a lot of people to maintain its existence. Uh, working through different key pillars, institutions in society, right, and often, as you can see here, the media is identified as one, right, that you want to try to target with your actions. Um, so, it's important, I think, to realize that for all of these pillars, but the media included, that they're not monolithic, right? That even though they have this bias right towards power, there are going to be individual journalists at, at probably most major media that might be sympathetic if you kind of approach them in the right way, right? And give them a compelling reason to cover uh, the story. Um, so you know, these kinds of relationships with journalists really need to be cultivated over time if you want to kind of uh, secure good coverage, right? And it's something that organizers should be paying attention to from the very beginning, right? Um, let's see. The next point, really, I think, is that media uh, movements need to do, you know, as much preparation as possible in advance, right? Um, that means doing all the basic things that you need to do, right, to get your story out and to do it well, you know, including having a person, a designated person, or better, multiple people whose job it is to interface with the media, right, and to direct people to who they should be interviewing. Um, and, uh, you know, Occupy, uh, again, had a, their own kind of creative uh, way of doing this that uh, even uh, by itself became a news story, but they had a network of uh, laptops and people that were doing exactly this kind of work, and uh, it was powered by people riding bicycles that were powering generators that were keeping the laptops going, right? And that by itself uh, became a big story, right, that the New York Times covered and many other media covered. So they were even creative in, in their kind of how they were, were producing their media, right, which was, was I thought, pretty brilliant. Um, but, you know, you also need to pre be prepared with the basics like talking points, right, and press releases, and also producing your own media, right, and your own uh, having someone who can do kind of take original uh, professional grade photography and, and video because uh, it's often going to be the case that you will be able to capture the most important moments better than the other media and you need to make that kind of free to use by the mainstream media because they're often looking for good photos and good video, right? Um, this has happened many, many times and as an editor, I, I'm surprised at how often this happens when I kind of get a story in that's really well done, but we cannot track down any good photos to go along with the story, and that by itself is going to really limit
speech, right? Because images are really powerful. And it's one of the first things that you see when a story is, you know, shared on Facebook or Twitter, right? Is the, the photo that comes along with it. So if you can't produce that, you're, you're really limiting your potential reach, right? Um, the third kind of, because of the media bias against movements, uh, journalists covering them and activists trying to get attention, um, you know, have to be really careful, right, just to get the facts right. Um, because any mistake that we make will be highlighted and exploited, right? They're looking for us to trip up. Um, so I think this is a common problem on some progressive or lefty uh, media, right, where they um, can kind of build large audiences by having sensationalized headlines, um, by having kind of clickbait, you know, as they call it, or by peddling conspiracy theories, you know, kind of on the left. But those types of places often aren't really respected for producing real serious journalism. Um, Mary, Mary King, uh, for us, was, was a longtime columnist for us. And uh, she, uh, back during the Civil Rights Movement, was doing communications work for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and at one point, she wrote uh, this column here about what that work looked like, what it involved. And it, it was, it's really, it was fascinating to see, and, and much of her guidance, I think, still really holds true. And what she said was that uh, there's a common misperception today with the civil rights movement that the media were kind of unambiguously on the side of the movement and that the journalists were kind of almost co-workers who were really trying to help share the story. And she said that is absolutely not true, right? That they had to work extremely hard to build those relationships, to build that trust with journalists and with, and with the media, right? Uh, to, to build this reputation for being honest. And she said that the way that they did this, um, she said a few things. She said was by avoiding sensationalism, by attributing facts to kind of named people whenever they could, to, uh, she said, having a style that was clear and unembellished with no opinion or value judgments, to underestimating the number of people that participate in movement activities, um, and, and then also to, she said, triple verifying any details of repression or atrocities against the movement, right? So that when you go public, you really can back it up, right? And you know that you're getting, you're, you're getting the basic facts right. Um, so next, I think, you know, journalists, as I was saying, kind of need to be given a compelling, uh, you know, reason to cover a story or excuse to cover a story. And there are a few ways that I think you can do this. Um, one is just by using kind of more creative tactics um, to get people's attention. You know, using stale, repetitive tactics not only hurts in terms of your ability to draw new people into a movement, but also makes it just really easy for the media to ignore you, you know, because it's just not interesting. And this, I think, is a common problem with a lot of, a lot of movements. Um, so I wanted to show you a video um, about one of my favorite kind of creative tactics that I've seen over the last couple years. It was developed in Spain uh, in response to a law that was uh, restricting free speech and making a range of protest activity like uh, protesting in front of parliament illegal and where you could receive fines of up to 30,000 euros, right, just for protesting in front of parliament. So what did they do? Uh, what did the Spaniards do in response? Um, they organized the first ever, ooh, there we go, uh, the first ever holographic protest of holograms, right? So they, they filmed people uh, protesting, marching, and chanting on green screens in safe locations around the city, and then they projected them in front of the parliament, so there was kind of a ghostly march, right, in front of the parliament. And they even organized to have a live hologram uh, 
at the march who could be interviewed by outside media. And this has just never been done before, right? So it, it needless to say, got a lot of attention around the world. Um, so better than me just explaining that, you should, I want to show you a video, right, that, that uh, kind of tells the story really quickly. So let me see if I can pull this up for you. working? Great. Yep. Okay. 2015, the Swedish government approves the gag law, despite criticism from the UN and objection from over 80% of the population. According to this new law, a person will not be able to protest in front of Congress, freely organize an assembly in public places, participate in protests without previous notice. In short, a person will lose their right to freedom of expression. Faced with this reality, we decided to protest in the only way the law allowed us to. demonstration in Spain. Thousands of people marched to protest a new law. That they say endangers civil liberty, but none of them were actually there. Well, your typical political rally, a unique way to express their discontent. The world's first holographic protest. Activists in Madrid held a demonstration via hologram. Hologram tentative. Hologram tentative. Manifestation virtual in Madrid. Hologram projection. Via a website that allowed anyone, anywhere to take their image, convert themselves into an apparition. And it opens up some doors and capabilities that I never thought were possible. The underlying argument is that holograms have more rights than humans. I mean, that's kind of another part of the other protest, which I have to say has it's quite it's quite an impact. You can't arrest the hologram, right? <laughs> the protest reached a global audience of over 800 million people. 400 million impressions were reached, opening a worldwide debate on the right to freedom of expression. 330,000 people signed the online petition to repeal the law, and the hologram protest went from the doors of the Congress to the inside. La movilización, señor ministro, continuará. Y la protesta continuará. All right. So that gives you just a sense. Let's see. How do I? All right. Um, can leave the lights yeah. off or that's fine yeah, yeah. so uh, we'll show another video in just a second so okay. that's yeah. fine um, so I, you know that's I think a great example right of just a really inventive creative tactic that that you know captured as you could see a, a mass audience right because of uh, the creativity not all of them have to be so complex right there's there's a lot of more simple ways of, of being creative and getting attention but I thought this was a particularly kind of unique one and it has been replicated in other countries, other movements uh, um, since. So it's nice to see that how, how these tactics kind of spread. Uh, another option beyond kind of creativity or related to creativity um, to, to get attention uh, is the use of humor, right? To, uh, to try to make them laugh, you know? Even journalists will appreciate a good joke. Um, so one of my favorite groups um, that kind of uses this approach is uh, called the Yes Men. Are, are you familiar with them? Yeah? Uh, okay. So, you know, they've been behind a real wide range of, of stunts over the last 20 years or so uh, that have gotten, you know, mass media attention. Um, and their kind of MO uh, is to often impersonate right, government officials or corporate executives in official, uh, in, in some official capacity at conferences or events. Uh, 
right, and to give ridiculous speeches that either take the official logic to some extreme, absurd end, you know, or they propose some policy shift on their behalf that we all would like to see, which then forces the government or the corporation to have to deny the good news or to sh change policy, right? And this has uh, surprisingly been effective over and over and over again. And um, they put out some really great documentaries, if you aren't familiar with them or haven't seen them, that I, I'd really recommend. But I just wanted to show uh, one video of one of their actions and it, that again highlights its impact, right? And how, how much media they were able uh, to get through using kind of humor. Um, let's see. So. We wanted to make a political point about an organization that's pulling off some of the world's biggest hoaxes. No, not this organization. The one across the street. The one that looks like a U.S. government office, but really is working against the government. In reality, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a large corporation that is reported to lie to the public on behalf of even bigger corporations. They spend nearly half a million dollars a day trying to convince the U.S. government to do really stupid shit, like killing environmental regulations and undermining workers' rights. But since they spend so much money on their hoaxes, many people believe them. And as it says, American Free Enterprise dream big, but their dreams are our nightmares, because their plans are to prevent us from passing climate change legislation, which means we're screwed. Since the chamber was hoaxing us all, we decided to fight fire with fire. We would reveal one of their biggest lies by masquerading as them. We would hold a press conference as the chamber at the National Press Club. How would the world react to the chamber suddenly reversing its position on climate change? The reversal on climate change from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to be able to reverse its position on the climate change bill and once a carbon tax, if you will. All right, so the U.S. Chamber is denying it. All right, so maybe not. <laughs> Apparently it was a hoax. Either there is a group or some people or a person. Is there any involvement of whatsoever. Uh, I couldn't even begin to go there, Larry. This is the item we got. It has the Chamber's logo that we're all very familiar with. Today, the country's largest business lobby, the Chamber of Commerce, got punked. It began early this morning when a press release went out, purportedly from the United States Chamber of Commerce. Amazingly, the release said that the Chamber would now support this legislation that it spent months fighting against. Reporters were surprised and probably confused at this odd turn of events, but that was nothing compared to what actually happened at the press conference when it was held later on this morning. Watch this tape. Clean coal is, is a, a technology that has not only not been proven, it basically doesn't exist. Okay, this is, uh, I'm Eric Wolfsley, I'm with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is not an official U.S. Chamber of Commerce event. Um, so. I don't know what pretenses you're here. I know some of you uh, in the press world, but this is a fraudulent press activity and a stunt. Who are you really, sir? And do you have a business card? Are you with the U.S. Chamber? I, I do. We can discuss afterward. Okay. Can I see your business card? Can I see yours? Are you here representing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce? Yes, I am. So I work there, and you do not look familiar to me at all. Could I see your business card? <laughs> Could I see your business? Yes, sir. Yes, I am. Uh, this guy is not the chamber of commerce. No, this is not an official chamber of commerce. This is not. Uh, what is your position in the chamber of commerce? I just spoke my position. What is your What is your title? Your official title of your chamber. I'm the assistant to Mr. Dominic. Okay. This guy is a fraud. He's lying. Um, this is you know stuff that I've never seen. 
for. So if you'd like to actually talk to the legitimate chamber of commerce, I've got my business cards outside. This gentleman, I will assure you, does not have any business cards and he's not legitimate. Show me your business card. No, show me yours. No, show me yours. It's so weird though. You don't look familiar. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says it was victimized. Victims of a hoax by environmental activists. A hoax actually led to the the chamber admitting that there is a challenge for climate change. It seems like a good first step. So next up, hoax is about poverty, violence, uh, hunger, education. Over educa the big education hoax. We've got the big education hoax. The hoax is a good first step. Yeah. Just today, the Chamber of Commerce changed positions, not courtesy of the yes men with that right. in Washington a few weeks ago. But they're now saying, uh, surprisingly to me, and I'm glad about it, that they want to get legislation, and they're now working with the sponsors of the bill. <laughs> so you can turn on the, the light. Ooh. Plug this back in. So, again, you can see how that dynamic works, right? How they kind of forced the chamber's hand, right? And they actually did end up changing uh, their position on the bill because of because of their action. But also, just how the mainstream media, you know, you could see even Fox News and CNN joking around about it, right? And uh, kind of. They, they kind of enjoyed the, the humor, right, of, of the action itself, right? So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, make them laugh. Um, next, I think, um, in addition to that, you know, persistence and sacrifice are just key uh, for movements if you want to get attention. To come back to Occupy again, because that's maybe the case I'm most familiar with, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you could see this dynamic very clearly, right? That, that earlier that year, there had been numerous attempts to try to draw attention to the role of Wall Street and our economic system in, in kind of contributing to all of our problems, right? And uh, at one point in May, there had been an or, uh, a rally on Wall Street, 20,000 people. But, but who remembers that, right? It didn't generate hardly any press. And the, the press that it did get was gone the next day, right? It just wasn't a news item. But 20,000 people on Wall Street, um, that's the kind of numbers that you saw at the height of Occupy, right? Um, uh, but it was one day, and it was passing, right? Um, versus Occupy, which at the beginning was 100 people, 200 people, but they didn't go home, right? They stayed, and that in and, in and of itself was newsworthy, right, and got people's attention, right? Just a small number of people kind of deciding they're not going to go away. Um, so it's that kind of persistence, right? But also for Occupy, you saw that the role of, of sacrifice in that the mainstream media really didn't cover them in, in a widespread way until um, a couple weeks in. Maybe you remember when there were uh, protesters who were pepper sprayed by the NYPD and that was caught on film. They had been kind of kettled, right, uh, behind orange netting and sprayed without provocation. And then that video went viral online and got a lot of attention. And then shortly after, you know, the police arrested over 700 people on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and that also got widespread attention. And I think this is where you see uh, the importance of kind of sacrifice and commitment, but also of, of nonviolent discipline, right? That because these were nonviolent actions, they made it very clear who was kind of in the right and wrong there, and it painted the authorities in a very negative light. And because of that, these, the kind of attempts at repression backfired, right? And uh, it drew a lot more people out to, to kind of come out to the square to check it out. And it also drew the interest and sympathetic coverage from the mainstream media. Um, so uh, another point, let's see here, is that really uh, if the press isn't coming to you, to your actions, that you need to go to it, right? Um, that they sometimes are just so focused on covering those press conferences and, and political rallies that we have to go and find ways to intervene or insert ourselves uh, 
into the stories, right, that they're already um, covering. Um, so one of the most shocking examples of this happened, I think, back in 1991 uh, by the anti-AIDS group ACT UP, right? Um, during the first Gulf War, uh, they stormed into the studios of CBS during a live primetime broadcast and began, took over the studio and the stage and started chanting, fight AIDS, not Arabs, right? And this was like on live primetime TV across the whole country. Um, this tactic has sometimes been called media jacking, right? And you can see it in a lot of different places. So you can see it in kind of how protests tend to follow meetings of big international organizations like the World Trade Organization or the G8 or um, political uh, candidates' rallies and, and, and uh, photo ops. Um, and uh, sometimes they're interrupted by people just getting up and speaking and, and yelling, or they can be, you know, more creative by um, singing or laughing. Um, one of uh, the most recent examples of this that I saw happened right before uh, Trump's inauguration when a group of activists um, kind of clandestinely got reservations at this very fancy restaurant in Trump Tower in New York City for brunch. And, and then at the same time, they all started to cough, you know, so they called it a coffin, you know, and uh, people didn't know what was going on, but it was about his move to try to repeal, right, uh, the Affordable Care Act. And because of that creativity, again, it got a lot of attention, but it was a way of, of doing this. Um, I, uh, let's see, I, I think you can also see this in kind of how activists can sometimes hijack uh, corporate or other kind of advertising campaigns, right, for their own purposes. And this is because there's already a lot of money that's going in to promoting that message. So if you can find a creative or interesting way to like take it over for yourself, uh, there can be a, a real power in that kind of an action. Um, so, uh, one of the more creative ones that I've <coughs> come across <coughs> happened in Serbia, for example, uh, during the run-up to the elections in 2000, when the resistance group Otpor, the resistance movement, um, produced over 1.2 million stickers with the slogan, Gotovce, which means he is finished, right? And they were able then to just slap them on any campaign poster, right, of Milosevic, which kind of immediately turned it into an opposition message, right? And since he had plastered his image and posters all over the city, they could just go around slapping on these stickers and turning every ad, right, into uh, a message for the opposition. So really a, a low-cost, creative way to kind of do that, right? I think uh, this is actually one way that I think Black Lives Matter has learned from Occupy's failings, right? And that Occupy kind of started to vanish or disappear in 2012, you know, as the presidential campaign was heating up and taking over all of the media's attention, right? And, and Occupy didn't really intervene in that conversation. And uh, so they just lost the attention. Um, among other reasons, but but Black Lives Matter, um, Black Lives Matter, you know, has uh, done did a much better job this last year, right, in in inserting themselves into the 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 campaigns, um, you know, interrupting rallies uh, of multiple candidates um, or photo ops and getting them to address their concerns. Um, one place where you saw this most clearly was with Bernie Sanders, you know, the impact of this, right? In that after multiple disruptions um, of his events, which some of which were also critiqued by uh, people in the progressive world, right? Because they, I think, didn't appreciate the strategy, right, that was going on there. Um, Sanders uh, ended up coming out with a racial justice platform that had really clear specific policies about how he was going to address police violence and other racial justice concerns, right? Um, so it wasn't enough, but it was a step in the right direction for him. And that, that just wouldn't have happened without these disruptions, right? This was the one in, in Seattle that happened. 
Let's see here. So while these are a few ideas for kind of how sympathetic journalists and organizers can overcome the hurdles of trying to get mainstream coverage, um, there are times when all this won't work. Uh, and thankfully, uh, the media ecosystem is much wider than that. And uh, there are a lot of alternative and independent media that we can still use and try to get, uh, that can try to help give attention to important movement stories. Um, social media also, obviously, like Twitter and Facebook, and uh, the kind of spread of live streaming, that ability has been, have been very powerful tools, right, that have helped sometimes propel movement stories into the mainstream. Uh, this is also where a site like Waging Nonviolence, which I edit, um, come, kind of fits into the big picture. Uh, over the years, we've published uh, over 3,500 original stories about uh, movements around the world from uh, over 450 different writers. And in the process, I think we've earned, at least to a degree, the respect of some of the larger media who have cited or republished our work, uh, like places like the Washington Post or CNN or v Vox News or The Guardian. So some of the biggest media have, have turned to us uh, during these moments. And so in the process of trying to build this audience and, and change the, the mainstream conversation around civil resistance, uh, we've learned some, some lessons about how to do this that I, I was wanting to share. So I think the first point here for me and like why we need movement journalism and how to do it is, is that uh, for those of us that care about movements, you know, it's important to acknowledge that you know, documenting and sharing these stories um, can be critical to whether these, any given action or, or campaign succeeds or fails, right? Um, that given the media's role in shaping public opinion um, and that movements need to win that over, win public opinion over, uh, uh, you know, securing this kind of coverage can be, can be critical, or producing your own coverage um, it can be kind of an integral part of nonviolent struggle, and in a way, it could almost be seen as a nonviolent action in itself, producing your own media. Um, so I think an important point here is that <clears throat> a role for us, or for smaller media, is to cover nonviolent struggles before they really take off, right? And after. Um, uh, and I'll explain, I'll explain that point. Um, you know, I think doing so uh, paints a more accurate picture of kind of the life cycle of a movement, right? Uh, and shows, the, like I said, the level of planning and preparation that goes into successful organizing, right? Uh, successful campaigns. And that decisions at earlier stages in movements are obviously can be very impactful and decisive about whether something ever takes off in the first place. So paying attention to a movement at that earlier stage is really important for those of us that want to learn best practices, how, you know, how things are working, what they might replicate, what you, what you should avoid. Right? A helpful tool for understanding this, uh, I think, can be found in, in Bill Moyer's work. He, he talked about eight stages of social movements that Social, most social movements go through in, in different ways. Um, this was published in his book uh, called Doing Democracy, which is, is, I think, still a very important text. And essentially what I think happens is you see this line here that says trigger event, right? I think this is when most media come into the picture, including most progressive media. They only come in Right, when something kind of takes off and you start to see lots of people on the street or it starts to get attention, this is when everybody starts to talk about a movement uh, and when it kind of is on people's radar for the first time for a lot of folks. But what we try to do is highlight the organizing that's happening in these first three stages, right? And to show yeah, how things are, are building, how they're building up that pressure and starting to shift before um, an event, you know, a trigger event could be something external, right, like a police shooting, right, where it ga gains attention, or it could be 
a, a nonviolent action itself, right, that is shocking or funny or creative, right, that captures a lot of attention, right? Um, and then I think another important point, though, is this is where most media happens, right, in this stage. But then there's also these final four stages of movements, right, where uh, the trigger event, often when you see lots of people in the street, if you think of, again, Occupy, or if you think of any of the major takeovers of squares in Egypt or in Turkey or in places like this, it lasts for a few weeks normally, maybe two, three months, you know, at the most, but you can't kind of sustain that level of activity for a really long period. So movements have to shift and evolve. And when they do, they're, they're more difficult to, to cover, right? And a lot of the media drop off again. And, and so again, I think this is where uh, movement-oriented media need to step up and show how movements really evolve, the ups and downs that they go through before they achieve success, right, at this stage, and when they have to kind of consolidate and defend their victories, which is really important. So, uh, so this is where I think we try to, to come in at, at, at either end of the spectrum, but not so much where everyone else is, right? Um, so just an interesting way to think about where I think uh, movement media is really needed. Also, I found you know, covering international struggles is really, really important because given how kind of US-centric our media is here, um, we are often not, not only the first, but sometimes the only media to cover really, really impressive organizing happening outside of our borders. Um, and uh, you know, with our very limited capacity, at Wage and Nonviolence, we we've normally have original uh, on the ground kind of reporting from about 25 to 30 countries a year, often from war zones or uh, you know places where people are organizing against really repressive authoritarian governments. Uh, for example, you know we had a story a few months ago uh, from inside Syria about how the people of Idlib city. Uh, were organizing to take back control of the city um, and doing so effectively uh, from kind of extremists, right? Without Assad and without outside military intervention. So this was, you know, at the same time that, you know, we were bombing Syria and that the government was escalating the war against ISIS, you know, we were telling this, I think, very important story, right, about how there are nonviolent alternatives, even in these most extreme kind of cases. And I think we were the only one to tell that story, right? Which is, to me, kind of crazy, you know? Um, because it is such a clear alternative to, you know, for what is, what is needed. Um, <coughs> uh, it's also important uh, to document these stories because, you know, we can share what's uh, kind of working strategically, tactically, right? So that other movements can, can uh, hopefully adapt and take what's working and use them in their own context. And at a more basic level, I think these stories, you know, uh, can help us build connections across borders and give us some sense of hope, right? When we see all these movements uh, popping off around the world. Um, but also we found that, that covering nonviolent campaigns in these other places can provide some degree of protection, right, for activists who are being targeted uh, for repression because governments realize that they're on the radar somewhere so they can't get away as easily with using violence or torture or things like this, right, because somebody's paying attention, right? So media is also plays an important role there. We've seen that this, this kind of coverage of ours, even though we are very small, hasn't gone unnoticed by those in power um, around the world, who I think sometimes recognize the danger of nonviolent struggle maybe better than most, right? Um, since the beginning of 2015, uh, we've been thankful to have regular on-the-ground reporting from inside Uganda by a guy named Phil Wilmot. 
who works with an organization called Solidarity Uganda, which does a lot of nonviolence training of, of activists in a bunch of different campaigns around the country. And uh, he has been recently uh, targeted, as, as have many other activists in Uganda, um, in kind of a pretty widespread, brutal crackdown on dissent in recent months. And we found out that one of the reasons why the government was really going after him was because of the articles on our site, which I was kind of surprised to, to learn. Um, and that they've been kind of heavily trolled, right, by, by uh, the Ugandan government. Um, so uh, this is a phenomenon that you, you see more and more, right, that governments are paying people online, troll armies, you know, to attack critics and dissent. So we've even been experiencing that ourselves. Um, some of the trolls, in his case, were, were more savvy. Like one commenter wrote, uh, Museveni was elected in a free and fair election, save for a few electoral malpractices, as could be expected. <laughs> so that's kind of the savvy troll. And uh, others were a little bit more to the point. Um, one wrote, some countries need a little dictator and a little democracy, you know, and every family has its own style of leadership. God bless President Museveni. And another said, you know, I'd rather go with the devil that I know than the angel not yet seen. So some were pretty, very, you know, much more open about their kind of support of the dictatorship, right? Um, we also learned uh, not too long ago from, let's see, from an article in Time magazine. This is just the last paragraph of the article here, which says that the term, the English phrase waging nonviolence was blocked by the Chinese government as a search term in China. So we're, we're really the only place that uses that term. So it, you could tell that it was kind of targeted towards people that are trying to find coverage on our site. So I was, I was really surprised to come across that. But you see that even we're on the radar of the Chinese government, right? That they, they, these countries pay attention to this kind of thing. Uh, another lesson that we've learned um, is, or the importance for this kind of media is to acknowledge our victories, right? Even the small victories along the way, which activists often aren't very good at doing. Um, and to raise up, you know, the role that nonviolent movements play in, in these advances. Um, while, that might not, while that might seem obvious, you know, if we don't claim our victories, other media will either ignore them or attribute them to the to people on top or to like bigger, more well-funded nonprofits, right, that, that have a better media presence, right, rather than the grassroots pressure from below. And needless to say, when that happens, that often uh, kind of invis invisibilizes the contributions of women and people of color and immigrants who are often at the forefront of nonviolent movements. And I think on a, another note, like, you know, <clears throat> not acknowledging our victories um, also denies our movements the momentum, right, that they need to grow, right? Because small victories can hopefully lead to bigger wins, and people want to be on the winning side of things, right? Especially if they're gonna, if they're gonna risk their time, money, you know, energy, maybe their bodies for a struggle, they want to know that they have some chance that it might be effective, right? So we need to take a step back and acknowledge the kind of victories along the way. Um, I, uh, let's see here. The next point is that, you know, I think we need to, we've noticed a need to kind of train a new generation of, of journalists, right, and how to do um, good movement reporting, and, and we see um, that as one of our kind of roles, but other media uh, should also be thinking along those lines, especially as we see this real upsurge in protest and nonviolent movements around the world that we're experiencing right now. Um, we, we do this by taking on writers who 
um, have never published before or have very little experience and working really closely with them in kind of our hands-on editing process, often through multiple drafts of stories right before we get to a final published article. Um, other media will rarely sometimes take on these types of writers because they're just too much work. Um, however, we think that if they have a perspective that hasn't been told or a perspective that is kind of denied from the dominant narrative, that it's worth that extra effort to try to tell that story, right? That it's one service that we should really try to provide. And I think it's that extra effort that also has led to our, our storytelling being at a more professional level, which then has been taken seriously by larger media, as I was saying. So I just wanted to give you a sense of, of this very quickly, of what this looks like. Um, here's one article that we published um, this summer about another small victory um, that went through a very serious editorial process. The story is about this uh, new project in, in the West Bank, um, the Mood Freedom Camp which was involved kind of a unique coalition of Palestinians and Jewish activists from Israel and around the world who were helping Palestinian families move back to their village and reclaim land that they had been displaced from over 20 years ago. Um, and so it was a powerful story, um, but it took a lot of work to get into shape. The kind of work that I think no other publication would have taken on, right? Um, so. Here's just a screenshot of the first few paragraphs of the first draft that I edited. And uh, this doesn't even involve like a very close line edit. It's more conceptual at this point. But you can see I'm like deleting whole paragraphs and lots of comments and restructuring. And this was, like I said, just the first draft. There were three additional drafts after this that went through you know, an equal amount of work before we could get it into kind of a publishable form. And, and needless to say, we, we got there, and I'm happy that we were able to share this story, but it's like, it's like this kind of process that we go through a lot, especially for international stories, where, where English kind of isn't the, the first language of the writer. <coughs> um, we also have had the good fortune of working with some really young and talented writers. Um, and, but even in, in this case, you know, training and editing is critical. Uh, we work with organizers to help them um, figure out how to talk about their strategies and struggles in a way that really can appeal to a wider audience. And we work with like, new journalists to, to help them understand how nonviolent movements work, right? so they can understand the intricacies of them and report on them better. We do this by by kind of working from the idea stage and, and helping them figure out what the angle is, um, sometimes suggesting lines of questions that they might ask when they're interviewing people. And other times we've sent books or reading material um, so that the writer can kind of delve into the case studies and the history so that they can provide better context for their stories. And so readers then move on up in the journalism world, which we hope that they do they'll take a much more sophisticated understanding of how nonviolent movements work right with them. And I think in this way we can make uh, the, the kind of accuracy and sophistication of writing on this topic kind of better across the media landscape, right, in a kind of a subtle way. We've helped discover and launch a number of writers um, in this way, one that we're kind of most proud of recently a woman named Kate Aronoff. Um, we, uh, we published the first story that she ever wrote back in 2012 when she was still a student at Swarthmore and she was leading the, helping to lead the student uh, fossil fuel divestment campaign at Swarthmore which then launched that movement nationally. Um, and, and also had an effect here. Oh it did? Yeah. Okay. So um, last year uh -huh. the best campaign forced you must to oh, that's that's great. I didn't know that. Um, we then brought this this woman on as a blogger, 
so she said it was her first job out of college. Um, we didn't pay hardly anything, but it was a job. Uh, and uh, we worked really closely with her as she was writing like multiple stories a week for us on how, like kind of fine tuning her nonviolent, her analysis of nonviolent struggle. Um, and then she graduated into a columnist for us. And then from there, In These Times magazine in Chicago picked her up as a writing fellow. And most recently, The Intercept has hired her as a contributing writer. But along the way, she's kind of added her unique voice to uh, so many kind of really large influential publications like the New York Times and Harper's and The Guardian and The Atlantic and Rolling Stone and lots of other places. So we're just thrilled to see her kind of leave us and take this stuff into much bigger venues, right? Um, that's the ultimate goal, even though it's hard for us to lose somebody like that. Um, so, uh, well, these are a few of the, the roles that I think movement media can and should play. I, I wanted to now just offer really quickly a, a more granular kind of look at, at how we approach stories right, uh, about nonviolent struggle and the kind of general guidelines that we try to keep in mind as we're trying to produce like a high quality, you know, high quality journalism on the topic. Um, let's see here. So yeah. So I think the first point is that, you know, the mainstream media often focus more on the what, right? Kind of just talking about what has happened, describing it, um, and often when they are talking about movement stories, they, they, they highlight the average participant's perspective, which is a piece of the story, but uh, those folks often don't have real insight into the mechanics, right, of, of how the movement is developing or where it's going. Um, and progressive media, I think, often put more emphasis on the why, you know, kind of giving the context for why people are in the streets which is really important. We try to offer that as well, but we focus more on the how, like how is a movement building? How are they building power? How are they organizing and trying to affect change, right? We think that the ans answering those kinds of questions are the ones that are gonna be more useful to other movements and other organizers, right? As they're trying to build their own struggles. Um, <clears throat> to do that, I think you need to focus on you know, doing real reporting, right? Spending real time with uh, those on the front lines and putting their, putting their voices first. Um, also, it means highlighting, highlighting really organizers' perspectives, right? That uh, most movements today, you know, don't have uh, one leader or sometimes a st structure but that doesn't mean that they're leaderless or without structure, right? That there's normally some core that is involved in making key decisions for a movement. And we think it's important to try to find out who those folks are, get to know them, build their trust, right? And then being able to ask kind of interesting questions about strategy and direction and challenges. And, and so you kind of have to do some real work to identify who those people are, because it might not always be obvious. Um, the next point is that uh, when you're trying to reach a, a wider audience uh, on the topic of nonviolence, we found it's important to really be aware, right, of assumed knowledge, right? That, uh, that a lot of, uh, you know, while that can't always be eliminated completely, we do what we can to try to reduce it. And that means stripping out um, or being very careful to explain uh, academic or activist jargon, right? That might uh, put people off, right? Uh, or make them confused or just make them feel like the stories aren't for them, right? Because they just can't follow and understand. And this happens a lot if you think of the use of acronyms that people use for organizations and movements without explaining them. And so we're always asking in our stories for the writer to explain key terms, groups, concepts that are known in the activist world but not known by the wider public, right? So that people don't get lost when they're reading stories. Um, on a related note, uh, you know, most people don't like to be beaten over the head with ideology, right? Uh, 
Um, with that in mind, we ascribe to a philosophy that, you know, if you want to reach more people, it's better to show right, rather than tell. That means kind of stripping kind of opinionated language from what are otherwise well-reported stories. New writers and activists often kind of shift between kind of a repertorial tone and opinion a lot. And so it's important to try to be consistent. If you're trying to do a reported story, make it reported and, and, and leave the opinion for a, a different kind of piece, right? An analysis piece. Uh, so they're often kind of, I think writers, new writers and activists are often kind of too didactic, right? You know, and they're trying to tell you kind of what to think. Um, so I think when that happens, it reveals, you know, the writer's bias and I think weakens the writing and makes anybody who's reading it who might not be on the same page politically, you know, question the entire article or the intentions, you know, behind the piece. Um, so, for example, that story on Palestine that I showed, in that first draft, he talked of, he was hiring and how he was touched by the power and wisdom of the organizers, and it wasn't inspiring and powerful, and there was wisdom there. He, it's better to show it right through the story, right, rather than saying it so directly, and let the reader learn that through the storytelling. Um, in a similar vein, this might seem odd, but we generally, even though the site calls for describing tactics as not um, in our story, our reported stories, we found that it's again far better to 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 show that rather than and by drawing out natural human drama in the story, right? Developing characters and setting scenes and, you know, doing all the th good things you have to do to tell a story. Describing nonviolent strategies and tactics, um, but maybe not naming them as such, right? Uh, in this way, you let, again, the power of the story and the voices of people that you interview speak for themselves. And uh, in this way, people kind of learn about nonviolence maybe without even realizing it, right? Which is kind of, I think, be the best way that we can kind of spread this information. Now this, just a final couple points here. Um, this might seem like an odd comparison, but I think we might want to see our role as something similar to that of the business press, okay? Uh, so like Noam, Noam Chomsky has kind of said multiple times that, uh, you know, publications in their, in their reporting, publications like the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal have to be more accurate and critical than the rest of the mainstream media because their readers, who are often business people, really depend on the accuracy of those stories to make kind of key decisions, right, business decisions. So in the same way, I think it's important for us to not be afraid of asking the tough questions and of being critical of movements that we're otherwise sympathetic to, right? Um, hopefully in a way that's constructive and can help inform organizers' next moves. I think too many lefty or movement-oriented publications fail to do this because they get too close to the movements that they're writing about, right, to, to be critical. Um, but I think, you know, publishing kind of glorified press releases or movement propaganda, uh, you know, ultimately isn't going to, it normally isn't engaging in the first place, but also isn't going to do a lot to spread a message very far or beyond kind of the choir, right? So we want to get these stories out to new audiences. And while they might not appreciate it in the moment, I think movements and organizers benefit from thinking critically about their strategies and tactics, right? So that we don't fall into a kind of groupthink mentality around, uh, around our struggles. Uh, we are obviously living through a, a really tough time, right? Historical moment. Um, but I think there's also a lot of uh, tremendous potential right now. You know, so many people are 
uh, getting involved in politics or going to their first action in their whole lives right now, um, which I find really inspiring and encouraging. Um, that said, we still have a long way to go, right? And there's lots of ways that it could go off the rails or all this energy that we're seeing could not lead to the changes that we need or um, could just fizzle. So to give us the best odds, we really need to tell the better story, right? And an inspiring story that's informed by like the, the wisdom that we have from movement veterans and from the best research that's coming out of academia on the topic. And that's why I think we need right now to uh, prioritize producing kind of accessible, engaging coverage and analysis of nonviolent action, you know, is more important now than ever. So um, that's, that's what I had. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.